Uh, so I, my um, plan is to overview the open questions in the uh, pulse and magnetosphere research and uh, give you a bit of an update on uh, where we are in understanding the pulsar structure. And um, I'll run through the different uh, ways people try to model the magnetospheres, run through different models and discuss their uh, respective advantages, disadvantages, so their successes and mainly failures. And um, finally, I'll try to uh, show some, uh, some information on the high energy uh, emission that we can infer from these uh, models. So uh, it's been a pleasure to, uh, to be at this uh, uh, conference and uh, you really appreciate that pulsars are really an observationally driven science. Uh, it's like the observers are these runners that are competing with each other, discovering better, faster, larger, far, farther, uh, cooler things. At the same time, the theorists are kind of stuck back at the uh, uh, start line trying to tie their shoelaces. When uh, we're, we're uh, really deliberate about tying these shoelaces and I, I think by the time we're done, we're real, we'll have a really cool running shoe, and then we'll, we'll be able to outrun everyone. But at the moment, we're kind of uh, slightly lagging behind the observers. So, uh, and uh, you can see that by just the, the questions that are still with us. The questions that are still with us is what is the structure of the magnetosphere, and how the fundamental things, how does the pulsar spin down? How does it spin down in different, uh, uh, in different stages of its life, for example? Uh, the, we want to understand what are the properties of the wind near and far from the pulsar in the nebula and uh, ultimately what causes the things that we see. So because the uh, spin down is something we, we don't observe directly. Uh, <coughs> so um, also we don't understand where the specs are actually coming from. So the main question of the structure of the magnetosphere is um, really a fundamental one because we need to uh, all of the emission physics has to go on the, onto the skeleton of the background of the uh, pulsar magnetosphere. So without the skeleton, we're uh, kind of get, uh, left with guessing what the, solutions, uh, uh, what the solution is. And um, uh, so the cartoon that we have is that the pulsar magnetosphere, in the generic case of the oblique rotator, is um, something that looks like that. So we have uh, an uh, open and uh, closed field lines. So uh, the uh, plasma is presumed to be correlating with the star uh, on the closed field lines and uh, that provides you a minimal amount of charge that has to be in the magnetosphere in order to supply electric fields to, to rotate these magnetic field lines around the star. So that's a minimal gold rate Julian charge density. But the amount of plasma in the magnetosphere can be orders of magnitude larger than that minimal, uh, minimal <coughs> amount that you need. The important uh, feature is the uh, light cylinder where you would have to correlate uh, at the speed of light and of course something should happen to the field lines uh, as they go through these light cylinders. Mind you, it's not a discontinuous surface necessarily, it's more of a continuous transition from the near zone to the, wind zone, uh, to the wave zone of the uh, radiation pattern. So we expect the magnetic field to be swept back around this surface and um, uh, ultimately the sweep back depends on both induction fields and also the plasma currents. And uh, the plasma currents are provided uh, by the, uh, in order to provide plasma currents, you need to create the plasma. So the, uh, the idea is that the plasma is born and discharges somewhere close to the, uh, to the star. You have accelerating uh, electric fields, which are accelerating charges, which fair produce uh, uh, emitting gamma rays. And uh, those gamma rays fair produce, and you create a, enough dense plasma to short out the accelerating field. That's the, the uh, overall uh, story. And then um, uh, as, you, as this plasma is outflowing, there's this current that flows along the field lines. This current is providing the um, toroidal magnetic field. And that combined with the toroidal electric field gives you a net uh, pointing flux. So you can see that that's the way the pulsar is losing energy. It's emitting out this uh, pointing flux. Uh, and uh, that current is ultimately closed, uh, going through this region, through the equatorial region, and coming back down to the star, <coughs> and then crossing through the star and uh, exerting a torque the spin down torque on the uh, on the star itself. So uh, the spin down is normally not seen um, directly, but only in gamma rays we're actually starting to sample some uh, significant fraction of the spin down energy uh, flux. So it's interesting to look at gamma rays uh, uh, in particular. So the models that we have right now kind of depend on the amount of plasma you assume in the magnetosphere. They range from pure vacuum models where you have no plasma to uh, fully filled uh, uh, magnetospheric models which are described by force-free uh, electrodynamics and uh, in between uh, there is a full uh, 
relativistic MHD, which includes plasma inertia. Uh, there is also uh, what I call ab initio particles, where uh, you just try to simulate everything uh, uh, self-consistently, including particle motion and particle uh, inertia. So uh, let me just give you a, a brief sample of uh, how these solutions look like. So this is the vacuum rotator. This is just a, a Deutsch uh, analytic formula. So uh, th this gives you a uh, rotating uh, vacuum uh, electromagnetic field. And uh, uh, this is not much of a model of a magnetosphere other than the field lines are completely analytically known. So you, you try to put more physics on top of this background uh, electromagnetic field. But you realize that it's not self-consistent because any kind of plasma will try to perturb this uh, electromagnetic field. Um, the other possibility, let's try, try to go through this list, is uh, ab initio particles. So here you, you say, well, let's start with uh, electromagnetic field. For example, this, this was an aligned rotator here. And uh, let's emit charges from the surface. There is electric field on the surface. They'll try to extract charges. They'll try to accelerate. And uh, for, for a second, let's say that there is no pair formation. So what you will get then is a rather funny solution. You don't get this wind outflow, but instead what you get is this electrosphere. So you get uh, negative charges shown in white here congregating around the uh, poles of the star. And uh, the red charges, which are the positive charges, are congregating on the closed field lines. And uh, this solution never reaches a wind. It just is trapped around the star. It seems absurd, but that's the, that's the way it is. Uh, uh, you, you actually do this calculation, that's what you find. So basically, it's an electrostatic trap which holds these particles uh, close to the star, doesn't, doesn't let out the wind. So uh, for a while, it, it's, it stayed like that, but this, is, this, is, this seems like a dead end. So the question is, is these completely charge-separated solutions, are they really dead uh, or not? And um, uh, here's a, 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 a simulation going into more than two dimensions, going into 3D. So this is the uh, poloidal plane. This is the equatorial plane. And uh, what you find is that these solutions are not completely dead. I would call them the undead solutions because they seem to be doing something, but they're still not uh, doing anything useful. So uh, there are non axisymmetric instabilities that happen in this ring. So this, this rotating charge ring is actually uh, unstable to what's called the diapatron instability. It's kind of like a kelvin kelmholtz instability, which appears because there is shear in this uh, uh, charge ring. Uh, and uh, that evolves, and, and uh, actually some plasma is transported across the magnetic field lines and uh, can leave, uh, leave the system. So in principle, you can drive some current across the magnetic field lines in three dimensions, not in two dimensions. But so far, it doesn't look like this is the, this is the true uh, true solution that leads to the wind, at least without the pairs. So there were recent very interesting uh, advances where uh, uh, pairs were introduced on top of this. So you still have charge separation. This was work by Yuki and Shibata, which will be discussed later today. And uh, there are some uh, now some outflows. You have particles leaving uh, over here, and you have some particles leaving across field lines here, uh, which means that they're uh, probably accelerated to very high energy, so they just decouple from the magnetic field lines. Uh, so that's an interesting solution. I'm not convinced this is the pulsar solution because I think there are still very large gaps that are accelerating particles too much. So if there were, if if, if there was more, if there was more plasma, these particles wouldn't try to cross the, the magnetic field lines. Also, I'm not I'm not sure um, in terms of electromagnet uh, electromagnetic spin down how much these solutions actually spin down. Uh, so they, they, they seem to be electromagnetic uh, systems, but I don't think the current is large enough to provide the spin down we actually expect. So um, this, this led to the, um, uh, this kind of uh, models with uh, particles flying in, 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 uh, in these magnetic fields and uh, having trapping regions and gap regions uh, forced uh, people to consider the uh, gapology of the, of the pulsar magnetosphere. So basically plasma is not uh, easily created along certain surfaces. So these slot gaps and the outer gaps be beyond the what's called the null charge surface, whereas space charge separated uh, flow would, um, uh, uh, charge separated flow would have to switch sign. Uh, so it is presumed that there's some gap here which can accelerate particles and uh, create pairs. And um, there's been a lot of work in trying to calculate these models. They're built on top of the vacuum field. So you, you take the Deutsch field and on top of that you try to propagate uh, uh, space charge limited flows and uh, uh, try to find the uh, local solutions uh, of the electrostatics. And um, there is a lot of work on the outer gap, the slot gap, and the uh, polar cap, uh, polar gap. And uh, <coughs> they're all very interesting solutions which, which lead to 
uh, actually calculable uh, models for the emission. However, they fundamentally have an issue because they're not self-consistent. They're, they're built on top of the field, which uh, does not include the, the currents of these particles. So um, uh, let's see. What other, what other uh, models can we do? We can try full uh, relativistic MHD, and this was tried in 2006 by Kamisarov. The difficulty with relativistic MHD is that you're, you're forced um, to simulate something that's extremely highly magnetized close to the star. So there is a, the magnetic field overwhelms any kind of uh, plasma inertia. So the numeric this is just very difficult. The equations become stiff, and it's hard to solve. Uh, so Kamisarov had to introduce this trick where he kept the, uh, the parallel velocity uh, inside some region, in, uh, large region inside the, in, inside the light cylinder to be zero. So he didn't allow any plasma to flow along the field lines here. And uh, that, that allowed him to simulate something that's relatively high magnetization. This is the aligned rotator. And you can see here the transition from the closed zone to the open zone and the formation of the current sheet. And there is pressure actually supporting this current sheet, which is uh, a very nice, uh, very nice advance. Now, the, the, the problem was, is still that uh, it's hard to simulate something more realistic with higher, higher magnetization. So to do that, you go to the next limit, and you assume that the plasma inertia is just tiny. You can ignore it. That's called the force-free limit. So there, uh, the equations of the momentum equation, just uh, this is the electromagnetic force. You set it equal to zero instead of the time derivative of the momentum. And uh, that gives you a constraint on the charge uh, and current uh, that uh, you can plug into the Maxwell's equations and uh, derive a system of equations you can evolve in time. So this is just Maxwell equations with a prescription for the current, which has a perpendicular component and a parallel component. And uh, the time-independent version of this is called the pulsar equation. So uh, there you can rephrase it in terms of the uh, um, uh, magnetic, uh, magnetic flux uh, encl enclosed by field lines. And it becomes this ugly uh, elliptic equation, which is very difficult to solve uh, in, in 2D and never mind the 3D. But it was done numerically in 99 by Kantopoulos, uh, Kazanas, and Fenn. And this is the kind of solution that they find. Again, the closed zone, open zone. So this looks like what we expect. And uh, <coughs> since about uh, 2006, we now have time-dependent solutions of these equations. So instead of doing an elliptic solve, you, you start with a um, time evolution, and I'm, I'm sorry this doesn't look that contrasty, but uh, what you're seeing here is a time evolution of the, uh, of the magnetosphere, uh, starting with pure dipole, you spin it up, and you see opening up of the field lines and creation of the current, current sheet, and um, uh, the, the, the color here is a sign of the toroidal field, and the current is flowing as, ex as advertised around the closed zone and into the, into the equator. Okay, so, um, you can also do this in 3D. This is the solution in, in three dimensions. And um, you can calculate the spin down power of these, uh, of these solutions. And what you find is uh, the uh, aligned rotators spin down uh, at uh, half of the power as the 90 degree rotator. So uh, the kind of uh, spin down formula you find is something that looks like 1 plus sine squared theta. I uh, warn you, this is not an exact formula. This is a fit to the data. Uh, so there may be other coefficients here. but Within 10%, this is the right formula. So um, that's uh, more on the structure of, the, of this 60-degree uh, inclined rotator. You can see the structure of the currents here. Uh, but anyways, this, is, this kind of solution has been now reproduced by several groups. And uh, we're more or less confident that this is, uh, this is OK. Uh, so let me just skip a few things here. Uh, this is uh, the, the 90 degrees. Uh, so you can see current sheets starting from the edge of the light cylinder and then going around in this undulating uh, structure, uh, going all the way out into the wind. So uh, it is important to realize that these solutions are probably just one part, uh, one, one uh, sector of a continuum of solutions. So as a function of plasma supply, we would expect these spin down power to actually go from this force free limit to the vacuum limit. And I encourage you to, to hear uh, Jason Lee's talk later today, who will describe the, uh, how this evolution can happen as a function of resistivity, effective resistivity in the magnetosphere. So recent advances have been uh, in, uh, along several directions, uh, taking you from these uh, for three simulations, both in 3D and the aligned ones, uh, you can uh, try to understand how the current is forming. How does the pulsar actually provide the current that you need? 
what you find immediately is that in different parts on, of the polar cap, the current can be either larger or smaller than the goldreich julian current. And uh, how does the pulsar make such a thing is, is, a, is an open question, and uh, Andrei Timokhin will discuss how this actually uh, happens uh, through simulations. Uh, let me talk about some of our work. So um, we now have uh, full relativistic MHD simulations in three dimensions. So uh, basically you have something that Kamisarov did in, in axis symmetry, which can be expanded now for an oblique rotator. So this is the work I'm doing with uh, Sasha Chikovskoy. Uh, so here's the uh, full relativistic MHD solution of an oblique rotator. And uh, if I didn't tell you that this was a relativistic MHD, you wouldn't know, because it looks exactly like the force three solution, right? So I probably, I may have just cheated you. I just put in the force three solution, but I didn't. This is actually a relativistic MHD, so there's plasma velocity here. We can actually calculate what it is. It's not dramatically relativistic. The, again, the, the issue there is what kind of velocity you start with, because uh, what are you putting onto the steel lines close to the star? Because MHD assumes some sort of an, inflow an outflow boundary condition. You need to in impose something at the star. And you don't exactly know what to put in. So this was just one choice with zero velocity uh, inside some region in the magnetosphere. But anyways, this, these kind of models are now progressing. So now you can do the same spin down power with relativistic MHD. And you find something very similar to force three, except this coefficient is 15% off. So as advertised, it's not an exact formula, but it's close enough for Garvin work. So um, this is the, uh, the ratio, the magnetization basically. So we can now simulate magnetization that's on the order of 100. Uh, this is the ratio of magnetic energy to the kinetic energy. And uh, you see that this current sheet is forming here. And in the current sheet, the pr plasma pressure is dominating. So the magnetization here is, is low in the current sheet. So that's, uh, that's interesting. So another recent thing that we've tried to do is to <coughs> go into this limit of uh, pure particle magnetosphere and see what happens if you uh, include effects of pair formation. So uh, it's very complicated to do it precisely. So instead, I, I just decided to do something dumb. Uh, and instead of actually calculating what pair formation is, I just decided to dump as much plasma as the, as the magnetosphere will take. Uh, so basically, I, I define this cube here. Uh, and the, the light, this is about seven light cylinders. The light cylinder is, is somewhere inside of this, of this cube here. And uh, I just continually inject neutral plasma into the magnetosphere and see what happens. So you have this ad beater there that's trying to throw this plasma out. But presumably, if there's enough plasma, it will try to short out the field. So something interesting should happen. So the first experiment is um, I'm, I'm putting that plasma in, but I'm not turning on the charges of the particles. So particles are just test particles in the electromagnetic fields. And um, what you find, so what's shown here, this is the full density of the plasma, and this is the density of positive particles. So uh, this is the sum of positive and negative, this is just the positive. I'm not showing the negative, it's basically the difference. What you see is that the positive and the sum is not exactly the same. That means that the electrons and protons or positrons are not in the same region. In fact, close to the star, you see this kind of uh, um, disk and dome uh, configuration that, uh, that we were discussing earlier. So it's charge separated. And uh, there is no clear current sheet uh, as well, because electrons are doing something else compared to the positrons. So that's what you would get if you just throw test particles at, at the Deutsch solution. Now, uh, the next thing is I actually turn on the, the charges of the plasma and uh, let it evolve. And what you find is that uh, the, now the full density and the positive density actually mirror each other. So now electrons and protons are, or positrons are in the same places. So Plasma back reaction is taking is, is doing is doing its thing, and now this tries to approach something that looks like more more of a uh, current sheet in the in the equatorial plane here, and um, a correlating magnetosphere in there. So what this tells you that if you put enough plasma, you will start recovering the force free limit, which is nice. So this is the the kind of solution that you get, and now with this you can do two things: you can study all of the things you did with force free, but also you can study the what the particles are doing. Where they actually fly, which is a, a missing ingredient in the in the force free limit. Okay, so um, how much time do I have? Two minutes. Excellent. So uh, now, given that we have this um, uh, force free solution and now relativistic MHD solution, what can we do with it, and uh, what can we learn about the uh, actual emission? So uh, first thing you can do is understand where does the emission actually come from, and uh, the uh, that's going to be driven by the ge geometry of the magnetosphere. So what you want to understand is how does the um, uh, classical regions of these gap regions that are presumed to be emitting relate to something that's done that, that you see in the force resimulations. 
So uh, what we've done with uh, uh, Shuning Bai uh, at, at Princeton is uh, to uh, select uh, region, select different flux tubes in the magnetosphere and look where they're beamed uh, on the sky and uh, calculate their, their light curves that you would get at the plasma order to just stream along those field lines. So uh, basically we, we took different rings on the polar cap and uh, traced the, the field lines into the magnetosphere. So this is kind of a, one of the flux surfaces that we've, we've traced out. And then we assume plasma streaming down these field lines uh, emitting along those field lines. And what you find are these kind of things with, that are called sky maps. So what's shown here is the observer, uh, observer angle from which the observer is looking versus the phase of rotation. And uh, what you see are these uh, bright caustics that, that occur uh, from the emission coming from different poles. So uh, as what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm switching to different flux tubes on the star. And uh, you, you look at the uh, where the where the emission is falling. And what you find is that there are some flux tube that produces uh, what looks like double peak uh, emission. And uh, so let me just freeze it here. So this kind of a light curve, this kind of a sky map would produce double peak light curve. So if you if you cut it across as the as the star is spinning, you will get two peaks. And um, uh, where does that flux tube uh, live in the magnetosphere? Uh, what you find is that flux tube is just hugging the current sheet. So this current sheet, actually, in most of the emission we need is accumulating beyond the light cylinders, so from maybe 0.9 and to about uh, uh, 1.5 light cylinders. And, uh, and from that, you can construct uh, a series of uh, light curves. And you can see that they're the generically double peaked. And uh, they compare very favorably to what Fermi is observing in gamma rays. So what we think is happening is that the emission is probably coming from this current sheet. Uh, so in, uh, this, is, this is just doesn't look good. So uh, in the line rotator, uh, this, this is the, where the current sheet lives. So presumably there is some sort of reconnection that, that happens in that current sheet. And uh, that reconnection is uh, driving the uh, heating of the particles. And those uh, heated particles will radiate uh, uh, gamma rays uh, when, you, when they're boosted uh, as they flow down the current sheet. OK, so basically I'm done. So let me just throw up my conclusion. So uh, we now have the magnetospheric shape in, uh, in uh, full three dimensions uh, in the limit of abundant plasma. And uh, these, um, uh, the, in order to explain the gamma rays, it looks like these models are predicting emission coming from these current sheets, which we call the separatrix layer. So I encourage you to not just think of the emission coming from uh, outer gaps. Uh, but there is also another player in town, which is the current sheet uh, beyond the light cylinder. And uh, I think we're right on the verge of more realistic models with 3D relativistic MHD and also with full particle and cell simulation. So I think in the next few years, there will be uh, interesting advances adding more physics to the pulsar magnetosphere. OK, so I'll stop here. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I know the radio emission is a small perturbation to you, but it's what some of us observe. Do you, uh, do you think um, your models would include uh, regions closer to the star where the, the sort of classic radio emission could come from? Uh, well, right, so it, it, absolutely, uh, eventually. <laughs> I think what, what Andre will tell you uh, is actually more relevant to radio emission. So I, what he's simulating is this processes closer to the star, where presumably the instability that leads to radiation emission comes from. So, yes, uh, we'll get it. Short question for Lee. <laughs> yeah, my question is on the magnetization. You said in your relativistic energy simulation, you can get to uh, uh, 100. So my question is, if you extend your computation domain to large distances, would that be able to go down? match you know the observation which requires the sigma of course less than one. Oh right. Yeah we did, we didn't yeah we, we didn't uh, run it that long to, to study the sigma problem. I think the sigma problem will still be there because this is an an ideal uh, relativistic MHD. So there is no no magic that should happen. Okay. okay. Um, thanks.